War Stories, Chapter 1 Over by Christmas, 1914 In the first four days of August, 1914, the world's most powerful nations declared war on each other. They lined up in two opposing camps. One side was Germany and Australia, Hungary, who were known as the Central Powers, on the other was Britain and France, together with their empires and Russia. They were known as the Allies in the course of the war. Other nations would be drawn into the conflict too. The Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria joined the Central Powers. Italy, Roman, uh, and Japan and China joined as the Allies. So did the United States. Despite the intentional reluctance of a great many its people, it was to be first real war, in that involved countries from every inhabited continent. Although most of the fighting took place on what became known as the Western and Eastern Fronts on either side of Germany, as news of the outbreak of war spread. Crowds began to gather in the hot summer sunshine, congregating in the great squares of the park of Europe principal cities. Far from being fearful or anxious, they were elated, like football fans, anti-participants, a closely fought game. Each side expected a war of great merchants and heroic battles quickly decided German Emperor the Kaiser told his troops they would be home before the leaves fell from trees the British were not so optimistic although it was frequently claimed that the war would be over by Christmas only a few Foresight politicians realized that was what was coming, including British foreign secretary Sir Edward Grey. Watching the dusk from the from his window on August fourth, day Britain declared war on Germany. Sir Edward sighed. The lamps are going all out over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. He, Melina wholly remarked, had a deep reason for a world would never be the same. And his fellow citizens were living in a strong, prosperous country with a vast empire. The war would provide a rude awakening for the grammar reality of the 20th century. Completely undermining Britain's position as the world's most powerful nation, almost all other participants in the war suffered a similar reversal of fortune, or worse. In France, half of all men aged between 20 and 35 were killed or badly wounded. Its immense position in the world would never recover. The Austro-Hungarian empire collapsed with repercussions that can still be seen in un the unstable Balkan nations of today. The Germans ended the war on the brink of a communist revolution and lost their own monarchy. The war swept away the Russian monarchy too, then bought the com brought the communists Bolsheviks to power, which with them came 70 years of brutal total uh, appreciation. Like many countries in Eastern Europe, the Russians have never really recovered from the First World War and its awful 
consequences. Only the United States did well out of it. By 19 it had come it become the richest most powerful nation on earth and was set to dominate the 20th century quite apart from the con its consequences there is something uniquely haunting about the first world war the second world war was far worse in terms of, co of cost of human life it claimed over four times as many victims it was also fought which much greater brutality. It came with such horrors as the Holocaust and the mass destruction of cities by aerial bombardment. But it did end with the overthrow of two undoubtedly evil regiments, Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, and a peace which lasted for the rest of the century. First World War, for all of its terrible cost, produced no positive results at all. City crowds gathered that August had no idea what was coming for years had it in store. The dreadful waste of life. What British statements Lloyd George would describe as the ghastly butchery of vain and insane offensives was something hitherto unknown uh, in modern warfare. But worst of all, when the final shell had been fired, the final gas canister unleashed, and the final submarine called to port, there was nothing to show for it except the awful air of unfinished business, and a tally of 21 million dead. Novelist H.G. Wells called it the war that will end war, and the phrase had caught on which was a gut-wrenchingly horrible conflict everyone hoped humanity would not be foolish enough to do again. The Varicelles Tr Peace Treaty officially ended the war in 1919. The proceedings were dismissed by a 20-year ceasefire by one of the leading participants, French Commander Marshal Foch. He was... Well, exactly right. By the early 1920s, people had already begun to refer to the war that will end war as the First World War. The causes of the war were many. A system of rival alliances between different European powers had built up in the previous decades as individual countries tried to bolster their security and ambitions with powerful allies. But although alliances provided some security, they also came with obligations. The events that would lead to war were set in motion in June 1914, when a Syrian student named Garivo Princip assassinated the heir of Australia Hungarian throne. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, in relation, Austria Hungary swiftly declared war on Siberia. But Serbia was an ally of Russia, so Russia joined in the war against Austria Hungary and all the other rival nations tied their receptive alliances. Were not dragged into the or not be dragged into conflict whether they wanted to be it or not. But why should a quarrel between Russia and Austria-Hungary over a little-known country in Eastern Europe automatically involve France, Germany, and Britain? It was because each was obligated to support the other in the event of war. And there were other long-standing res residents too, Britain and then world's gr war greatest empire maintained her power by means of world's greatest fleet. So when Germany began to build a fleet to rival the Royal Navy, relations between the two countries deteriorated sharply. The British and French both had vast colony empires, colonial empires. Germany similarly proposes a powerful, prosperous and powerful 
had very few colonies and wanted more. They all joined in fighting to maintain or improve their position in the world. The reason the conflict was so horrific is easier to explain. The war occurred at the moment in the evolution of military technology, when weapons to defend a position were much more effective than weapons able to attack it. The previous 50 years had been seen as the development of trench fortifications, barbed wire, machine guns, and rapid fire rifles. All of this made it simple and straightforward for an army defending its territory, but an army attacking a well defended territory had to rely on its infer infantry men, armed with only rifles and bay bayonets. They were able to be slaughtered in their millions. Yet, all the generals involved in the war have been trained to fight by attacking, so that is what they did. They also been trained to think of cavalry as one of their greatest offensive weapons. The cavalry is still armed with lenses, as they had been in previous two thousand years. Took part in a few battles, particularly at the start of the war. But these elite troops were quickly massacred. The tactics of Alexander the Great, Jensi Khan, and Napoleon, all of whom had used cavalry to great effect, which were no match for the industrial scale killing power of the 20th century machine gun. There were ugly, other ugly tr additions to the new technology of warfare poisonous gas, fighter and bomber aircraft, zeppelins, tanks, submarines, and especially artillery, artillery, field guns, how howizers, etc. Armies had long used cannons, but the time of the First World War, these weapons had reached a new pinnacle of sophistication. They were much more accurate and fired more rapidly than they had done. The shells they had fired contained a high explosive sharpenel metal balls or gas over 90% of all casualties in First World War were caused, caused by artillery, as artillery could be used to both attack and defend. It gave neither side an advantage. It simply gouged up the battlefield landscape, making fighting even more difficult and dangerous for the hypus participants. War began with a massive German attack on France, known as the Chevlin Plain as after its originator, General Alfred Jaff von Schaeflin. The plan called for the German army to wheel through Neutral Peglum seized Paris. The idea was to knock France out of war as soon as possible, apart from neutralizing Germany's most powerful rivals. This would have two other advantages. First of all, it would deprive Britain of a base on the continent from which to attack Germany. Second, with their enemies to the west conquered or severely disadvantaged, Germany would then concentrate on defeating the much larger Russian army to the east. The fighting in the late summer and early autumn of 1914 was among the fiercest of the war. Both sides suffered huge losses. At the Battle of Monterey, the German advance was halted less than 24 kilometers, 15 miles, from Paris. By November, the armies had become bogged down in opposing rows of trenches, which stretched from the English Channel down to the Swiss border. Give or take it, the odd few miles here and there, the front line would remain such as the name for the next four years. On Germany's eastern border, its armies won crushing victorious against the vast hordes of invading Russian troops. At Tenenberg in late August, the Masserian Lakes in early September, they prevented the Russian steamroller from overturning their, overrunning their country. 
From here on, the Germany army would gradually advance eastwards. In 1915, there was an attempt by British and ANZAC, Australian and New Zealand Army troops, to attack the Central Powers from south via Gapoli in Turkey. The strategy was a disaster. Between April and December 1915, around two 200,000 men were killed trying to gain a foothold in this narrow, hilly peninsula. By 1916, the war was supposed to have ended by Christmas 1914, looked as if it would last forever. Determined, in his own words, to bleed the French army white, the German chief of staff, Ernest Rich von, launched an attack on the fortress Verdun in February. His strategy was a success in some ways. The French army almost lost three. 150,000 men and never really recovered, but Falkenhayn's own troops suffered 330 casualties, thousand casualties too, and the French held on to their fortress. Von Valkhalen was relieved of his command, while on May 31, 1916, the German high seas fleet challenged the British Royal Navy in the North Sea. At the Battle of Jutland, an all-out confrontation. Fourteen British battleships, fourteen British ships, and eleven German ships were lost. If the British navy had been destroyed, then Germany would undoubtedly have won the war. Island Britain would have been starved to submission, as cargo ships would have been unable to sail to British waters without being sunk. The British may have lost more ships at Jutland, but the German Navy never ventured out to sea again. In British naval blockade, Germany remained intact. A pattern was emerging of titanic struggles, vast casualties, and almost indifferent residuals. results. Worse has to come. Worse was to On July 1st, 1916, another great battle began. The British launched all-out attack on the Somme in northern France. The British Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Heige, was convinced that a massive assault would break the German front line. This would enable him to send his cavalry and allow his troops to make a considerable advance into enemy territory. The attack known as the Big Push failed in the first few minutes and 20,000 men were slaughtered in a single morning. Yet the battle in Sony dragged on for a further five miserable months. By 1917, a numb despair had settled on the fighting nations with a paling stubbornness. Field Marshal Hig launched another attack on German lines this time at Pachenel in Belgium. Bad weather turned the battlefield into an impenetrable mud bath. Impenetrable mud bath. Between July 31st and November 10th, when the assault was finally called off, both sides had lost a quarter of a million men. Two other events, 1917 had a massive consequences for the outcome of the war. The Russian people had suffered terribly and in March, the revolution forced Tsar Nikol II to abdicate. In November, the radical Bolshevists seized power and opposed the communist dictatorship on their country. One of the first things they did was make peace with Germany. The Bolsheviks assumed incorrectly that similar revolutions would sweep through Europe especially in Germany. So believing that Germany would soon be a fellow communist regime who would treat Russia more fairly, they agreed to a very disadvantageous peace treaty at Risk Litovsk in March 1918. Germany took vast tracts of land from Rus the Russian Empire. 
for Germany, this was a great victory. Not only had the they added a vast chunk of territory to their eastern border, they now could concentrate on their forces beating the French and British. But despite their success, events were conspiring against Germany. After the Battle of Jutland had failed to win, them da. After the Battle of Jutland had failed to win the dominance of the seas, Germany had drifted into a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. This meant that German U-boats would attack any ship headed for Britain, even those belonging to neutral nations. It tremendously affected strategy, but it backfired drastically. The submarine attacks caused outrage overseas, especially in the USA. It became one of the main reasons America turned against Germany. President Woodrow Wilson brought his country in on the side of the Allies on April 6th, 1917. But it wasn't until summer of 1918 that American troops began to arrive on the Eastern Front in great numbers. The timing could not have been worse for the German army. The Ludendorff Offense, named after German commander Erich Ludendorff, began on March 21st, 1918. Forty-six divisions broke through weary British and French troops on the summer and swept on to Paris. For a while, it looked as if Germany would win the war on the Eastern Front, as well as the Western Front. So alarmed were the British that Field Marshal Haig issued another order to his troops on April 12th, commanding them to stand fight until they were killed. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight to the end, it said. But the Lundorf events turned out to be the last desperate fling of a dying army. Faced with stubborn British resistance and flesh and eager American troops, the German advance to ground gra advanced to ground to a halt. The German army had no more to give. At home, the German's population starved after four years of a blockade by the Royal Navy. It was on the verge of revolution. In August 1918, the Allies made a massive breakthrough against the German front lines in northern France and began an inextinguishable push towards German border, facing mutiny among his armed forces. Revolution at home and an invincible invasion of home territory. The Kaiser ab abdicated and the German government called for an armistice. A ceasefire. The time was not set to be 11 a.m. on November 11th. Oh wait, the time was set to be 11 a.m. on November 11th, 1918. Fighting continued right up to the final seconds. In his memory, General Lundorf recalled the situation with anguish. By 9th November, Germany lacking any firm guidance, Bariff of all will, robbed of princes, collapsed like a pack of cards. All that we had lived for, all that we had fled for long years to maintain, was gone. Although there were a wild celebration in Allied cities, many of the soldiers on the Western Front took the news with a weary shrug. We read the papers of the tremendous celebrations in London and Paris, but could not bring ourselves to rise even a cheer, wrote one New Zealand artilleryman. The only feeling we had was one of great relief. The guns fell silent. Grasses, weeds, vines gradually crept over the desolate battlefields, covering the withered trees and ravaged fields and turning the blackened earth into a pleasanter green. Crude, makeshift, brutal grounds were replaced by towering monuments and magnificent cemeteries. Many of those killed found a final resting, resting place among long rows of marble crosses, 
each with a name, rank, and date of death engraved upon it. Others whose torn remains were incomplete and unrecognizable were buried under crosses marked known unto God. It would be another 10 or 15 years before the charred trucks, shelled carcasses, and tanks were taken away for scrap and the shell holes filled in. By the time the war broke out again, in 1939, much of the land was being farmed again, but the faint smell of gas still lingered in corners, and corpses rusting, rusting rifles and helmets still lured the, the hard ground. Shell cake cases, are a panel fragments, and bone could still be tilled from the battlefields of northern France and Belgium, as they can to this day. End of chapter one. Wee wee.